So thank you very much for, for the introduction. I should say I was unaware of the UCAN, um, UK Acoustics Network, and uh, since that I've been looking at uh, some of the webinars and sharing some videos, seems to be a very vivid and uh, active network. So um, very interesting to be aware of it. And of course, I'm very grateful to, to have been invited. Um, so I will be talking about, um, yes, research work that um, a summary of like five, 10 years of research work and on high order uh, finite elements for acoustics, time harmonic acoustics. So some background, uh, you, you already uh, alluded to it. So uh, maybe just a word uh, on my PhD there. I, um, I was um, trained and inspired by two um, clever individuals, uh, which I think I meant, I mean, I'm mentioning them here because they have both spent a number of years in the UK. Um, Emmanuel Perret de Bain and uh, Gwenel Gabar. And um, yeah, they were very inspirational to, to my work. So uh, I, um, maybe some of them um, in the audience are aware of, um, of them. So I, I'd like to, to pay them a, a tribute. Um, so as you said, I'm, I'm, I work first for, for LMS as a developer, where I was uh, basically working on the cis noise kernel that maybe uh, rings a bell for the older ones. I think was one of the first um, say finite element uh, and boundary element acoustic uh, commercial products dates back from the late 80s and yeah the, the kernel had not changed um, you know from 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 these days when i arrived in 2008 and i spent a few years basically reworking uh, rewriting that kernel to uh, uh, you know introduce um, some of the ideas i'll present today and then as we were acquired by Siemens, um, I became responsible of, of the computational acoustics research there. And so what do we do? We, we, we do pre-development mostly. So we're not developers. Um, we are really working a bit more upstream. Um, we, we try basically, we do mostly Python and, and, and MATLAB, a bit of Fortran and C++ too. But uh, essentially we, we, we try to look at the research, the academic research, and 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 you know try to assess which method you know could be industrialized. Um, we try to do a bit of innovation to democratize also the, the tools um, because our users are not experts. Um, so our tools are the Siemens DI software tools, uh, Seam Center 3D Acoustics. That's that's the name of it now with FEM, BEM, and DGM, and also on the CFD side, Star CCM Plus. Um, so that's based on finite volumes. You can do acoustics in there. Um, uh, with a bit of a different scope. Um, but um, yeah, this, this, these tools are, are, let's say, especially SimCenter 3D Acoustics is, is really intended for non-specialists. So most of the work I'm gonna present today is you know, trying to pick up the, the, the most uh, interesting methods from the literature, from academia, and, and to bring it to, to broader industry. Uh, that's just a presentation of, of the team I, I lead in, in Leuven in Belgium. Um, clever individuals. Uh, I will not uh, present the work of all of them, but you know many of them have contributed to to, to what I will present. So um, thanks for that. Uh, so it's a sizable team uh, with five uh, permanent researchers, and we have between five and seven PhD students and postdocs. And uh, yeah, I want to take this occasion um, to say that we. I have a bit of a hybrid functioning in the sense that we, we try to stand really in between academia and, and industry. Um, and um, we uh, have many ongoing collaborative research projects, um, which we not only sponsor, but also actually actively contribute to the research. Uh, so we collaborate a lot with KU Leuven, um, um, with Le Mans, uh, especially Professor Gabar uh, and Professor Dazel. But Professor Gabar actually is, is has uh, inspired uh, many of the research that I will, most of the research that I would uh, present afterwards. So uh, we, we've, we have a long um, track of collaboration. So, so yeah, the research I will present has some UK DNA in it uh, because uh, you know it started when he was still at ISVR. We, we, we do have now still collaboration with ISVR with professors at Astley and Tester. Um, uh, some, um, Van Karman Institute with Professor Schramm on aeroacoustics. Uh, we also started a collaboration with Professor Gezen in Liège, and uh, I'm a GMESH um, you know, fan, so I'm very happy of this collaboration. We have a PhD student together uh, with the uh, uh, University of Nancy and Professor Xavier Antoine. 
uh, Ecole Centrale Lyon for Aero Acoustics. Um, and also we, we, we were grateful that we've been invited to participate in a, um, in a research project co coordinated by Maria Heckel from Kiel University on thermoacoustics, uh, where we also collaborate with Professor Polifke. Um, so we, we, we have yeah, many really try to, to be active on, on um, trying to find funding. Uh, it gives us sort of financial autonomy to, to work a bit more upstream, uh, to have a bit more independence, and also to you know, try to steer a bit more the, the, a bit the research that is performed, um, that, that is done at university level uh, to yeah, explain our needs. And, and um, it's, it's um, mutually fruitful, I believe. And uh, I, I take this occasion also to mention that one of our most experienced researchers, uh, Dr. Renaud Attac, has now uh, joined Cambridge office. Uh, so he's, he's an expert in boundary element methods, in isogeometric methods, in model order reduction, and he will be looking soon for, uh, you know, extending his UK network. Um, and also, I hope, participate into uh, EPSRC projects. So if you're looking for an industrial partner, um, an active partner in one of your projects, um, please reach out to us. Um, so just maybe a, a quick introduction on, on, you know, you can solve um, wave problems, uh, acoustics problems in frequency domain or time domain. Uh, I will be mostly I will be focusing today on frequency domain. That's, I would say, mostly what we do. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, you can model complex damping. Uh, you can have, um, you know, have multiple load cases uh, to to really uh, test your design. Uh, but I would say one of the most important um, aspect of it is is that you can use it in non-expert mode. Uh, it's you, it requires less input parameters. It's a simpler post processing. Um, in the end, when 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 you, when you solve in time domain, you require a bit more. Um, know-how. And since our tools are used by non-experts, uh, we, we, we try whenever possible to, to, to you know, point them to, to frequency domain analysis. In the end, the, the, you know, the Fourier transform is, is a way to simplify the problem at the beginning. And in the end, when you do time domain analysis, you very often um, you know, do an FFT uh, at the end to, to extract the results and interpret them. So. That's, I think, one of, of the reasons. Now, the big problem, of course, with, with frequency domain is that it's not scalable. It's highly memory intensive. So there's a, you know, a, a glass ceiling that's, that, that is difficult to break. Um, and we were trying to with high order adaptivity and, and domain decomposition methods. But of course, um, when it gets really, really um, high Helmholtz number, then um, time domain methods can, can be instrumental. Um, so the, the context of, of, of uh, you know, the type of methods we'll look at, so time harmonic, interior, exterior, finite elements, acoustics problem. Um, typically, you know, we have, we want to solve these problems on a large frequency sweep. Uh, although it's written in textbooks that, that you know, time harmonic uh, representation is useful for tonal, um, we see it used a lot for broadband as well. And that's important uh, because it spans a huge range of length scales. Um, so on the audible range, uh, there's an, a length scale of, of, of one to thousand. And if you combine this with the fact that um, we have to solve on, on complex geometries, um, uh, you know, it makes it, it makes it challenging because the geometries themselves are multi-scale. Um, you have millimetric de details, uh, you know, sometimes uh, even the bolts are present and up to the length scale of the object itself, which can be several meters, um, and uh, that's such a challenge for the for the measures, uh, and something that maybe in academia, you know, it's not always addressed because um, it, it, it's, 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 it's it it makes it challenging, and it's a threshold that not not all the methods can 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 pass. Um, so. When I arrived at, at LMS in, in 2008, uh, the Cisnes kernel was still based on conventional FEM, linear and, and quadratic uh, ISO parametric FEM. And it was, it was, the workflow was very, fairly impractical because you, you cannot use a, a different mesh per frequency. Uh, it's very impractical. Uh, it's not always uh, easy to automate or possible to automate the meshing completely. Um, and so what 
users would do is to create the mesh for the highest frequency or a very fine mesh and essentially just using it across the whole frequency range, which is inefficient, right? Um, so the, the other um, aspect is that conventional FEM suffers from the pollution effect, that's well known. So our higher frequencies typically, you know, accuracy would degrade. We would claim that six elements per wavelength would be sufficient, but it, it is not. And that's it's especially visible on derived quantities. You might, you might get your pressure you know, accurate enough for engineering accuracy, but most of the time, actually, our users, they don't, they, they, their KPIs for acoustics are based on velocity or intensity, transmission loss or radiated acoustic power from, from an engine. And um, these are very inaccurate because they, they converge with, with a, um, you know, a lesser order. And um, that, that was causing us some, some, you know, posing us some, some severe difficulties. Um, so I had uh, studied uh, PFEM during my PhD and, and implemented some, some, some PFEM acoustics code. Uh, so I, I knew the technology was very efficient. Uh, so we're talking here of integrated Legendre shape functions, uh, conventional PFEM. Um, the, the key property is that they are hierarchic uh, by contrast to Lagrange polynomials. Uh, hierarchy means that um, the, the basis at order p forms a subset of the basis at order p plus one. And that's key in, 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 in adaptivity. You can very easily need together two elements with two different orders without having to, to do any processing. Um, again, by contrast to Lagrange uh, shape functions, uh, where you would have non matched in nodes. Here, it's, um, it's, it's immediate. You don't have to do any treatment. So you can very easily have uh, you know, varying orders across the mesh. Another important aspect of it for the performance, and we've shown that uh, it, it's key to its performance, it's condensation. Uh, actually, at high orders, the, the majority of, of the shape functions are bubble shape functions, and the, their trace is, is zero on, on the boundaries of the element. So you can, at assembly level, uh, pre-solve them. So that's a very efficient pre-solve parallel um, um, of, 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 of your system of equations, and it reduces just drastically the, the memory requirements. So when, when I arrived actually at LMS, um, I was, it was striking to note that um, finite element experts were a bit dubious about PFEM. I think the reason stems from the fact that uh, the PFEM is an old technology. Uh, it dates back from the 80s. Um, and there were in the 90s attempts at MSC and uh, NX to introduce PFEM for structural analysis. There were, um, you know, developments, massive developments made to have um, PFEM elements for, for structures. Uh, it was a failure, um, an industrial failure for a number of reasons. Uh, I think coming from the fact that in structures, stress concentrations uh, play a key role and they are not well captured using P adaptivity, obviously. Um, and the other reason is um, that there were not, um, adaptivity wasn't, wasn't very well supported. Um, so it was mostly fixed order and it's, it's a bit cumbersome then. So basically PFEM had a bad reputation. That, that was my, my feeling. And um, when, when I arrived at LMS, they basically told me, okay, PFEM, but we know we've seen that. Um, we know you can reduce the degrees of freedom, but you know, you have more doffs on each element. They are more intimately coupled. So can you uh, really uh, um, in, in, improve, improve the runtime basically because you will increase the bandwidth. So I did this small exercise, um, which, which was published in, in 2016 in this paper um, where uh, we, we looked, we, we took a cube. Um, can, can you see my mouse, by the way? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, we can. Okay, lovely. Um, so it's basically a cube where I, I throw, I'm, I'm throwing in a um, hundred or, or, or plane waves of, of all the incidences and uh, using characteristics, so it's a well closed program. And I, I generated a very high number of meshes, uh, unstructured meshes. Um, and uh, I basically, uh, you know, compute the 
for each of those meshes. So this is the number of DOFs. So this is the error. So if you move on along the curve of, of, two, of, of, of P equals two, so that these are quadratic, uh, P, uh, um, quadratic interpolation for the pressure. I'm solving Helmholtz here. And you see, as I, I basically refine the mesh, I, I get more and more accurate. Uh, um, and it's interesting to look at you know, fixed accuracy here, 1% on the relative H1 error. Um, what is the actual number of degrees of freedom? So what this graph says is that you need a million DOFs uh, with cubic um, finite elements uh, to get to, to 1% accuracy. And you need an order of magnitude less with order 10. Now, I mean, the, the, those, those finite element experts were right, right in the sense that if you now look at the number of non-zeros, surprisingly enough, um, they, all the curves um, lie on top of each other, which basically means that the, the order 10, um, you know, um, matrix, although it's an order of magnitude smaller, every row contains 10 times more DOFs, uh, more entries, sorry. So at the end of the day, the, you, you don't reduce the number of non-zeros. Uh, you don't reduce on the matrix um, number of entries. Um, but the thing is that if you now look at, this is mumps here, but we had similar figures for Pardizou and um, uh, sparse linear solver. Uh, actually, mumps is it's still much easier for mumps to solve um, the order 10 um, matrix than the order three matrix. So it scales more like the number of DOFs than the number of non-zeros uh, because of feeling essentially because these DOFs are, are because of the structure of the matrix. And um, it's the same figure for, for the, the required memory. So essentially you can solve, this is uh, Helmholtz number of 50. You can solve this problem using uh, uh, order 10 with, with only uh, here like two gigabytes or so, whereas you would require 30 for, for a cubic uh, finite element. So I think this is an important result. And it's, I saw some results in the literature indicating that there was a sweet spot at the order four or five and um, that above you were degrading. It's not our, I mean, our experience is different. And, and um, actually you can push it up to order 10 while still gaining. Um, of course, you know, you don't gain so much above uh, order, say order six, but still significant. Um, uh, John mentioned the, this paper um, uh, in, in his introduction. That's a work we've done with uh, Alice Dieu and, and Gwen El Gabar. Um, Alice was our PhD student. And at the time, they, when I was doing my PhD, there was a, an important research trend um, on, on, you know, uh, trefs based and physics based methods, uh, which were using, um, you know, the, the general argument was that if you, if you use plane waves, or canonical, canonical solutions in, of the underlying equation, it's better suited than polynomials to, to construct an approximation basis because they incorporate key properties of the exact solution, such as the you know, wave number. And therefore the expectation is that they provide a more accurate and, 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 and efficient family of functions to, to interpolate the solution. So uh, Gwenel at, at the time had um, uh, a DG, um, plane wave uh, code, which he has shown in a paper to be uh, almost equivalent to the ultra weak. And uh, we also had the partition of unity code in 2D Helmholtz and um, the DG plane wave was, was showing to, 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 you know, to perform equally well. So we, we, we decided to make a, a, a comparison a study, a systematic comparison study between PFEM and um, the DG with plane waves. And we were a bit surprised, to be honest, by the conclusions. Uh, I call it a controversial conclusion because it's it's a bit uh, it's not intuitive. But we realized that um, you know this intuitive expectation that that Treff's methods are superior it did not necessarily translate into benefits in terms of interpolation accuracy. And somehow, high order FEM bears some advantages. Um, when it comes to uh, inhomogeneous media, for instance. Um, so this was published in 2016, and it comforted us in in the the, the you know this idea that that high order polynomials were suited for acoustics. And I think in, in the group of of John Trevelyan, they have reached similar conclusions uh, in in in, um, in in some uh, work I've seen as well. 
Um, so the question, the next question we had is that imagine that you know we get a mesh from a, a customer for a given application. Typically, because we handle complex geometries, this this mesh would be overly refined in some areas, and it would be an inhomogeneous mesh. How do you assign the order? Um, at first, I looked into the classical P adaptivity, which consists in 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 solving a sequence of solutions and it, examining them with a, an a posteriori error estimator and, and trying to, to convert. Uh, I, I, it, was, it was successful to some extent, but it, it proved very slow because in the end you had to solve many problems to, to reach to the satisfactory uh, to, to, uh, uh, stage. And uh, for our purpose, which, which was, you know, we, we were interested in engineering accuracy, uh, solving real life problems. Uh, I really wanted to have something more of an a priori error indicator, trying to infer before the calculation to launch only one calculation, do it right the first time kind of strategy. So we looked into a priori error indicators. Um, the, the most famous uh, HPFEM result for a theoretical HPFEM estimator for acoustics is, is the following one from Iemberg and Babushka. And uh, we tried to use it, but it wasn't very useful for engineering purposes, we found out, because the constants C1 and C2 are highly problem dependent. And this estimator is very accurate, mostly in the asymptotic regime, whereas in engineering, we operate mostly in the pre-asymptotic regime, right? When we, do, we don't want to have an overkill solution. So we tried instead to, to, to rely on our own um, ways and we derived an error indicator it's it's not an estimator it's an indicator because it's not mathematically proven but it's um let's say um we we, we, we proved robust enough uh, over the years um uh, although um yeah it, it does not rely it's really heuristics based um so the simple idea there, there are two versions but the, the the second version which is the more powerful one is is, is explained in that uh, jcp paper from 2019 um and essentially the, the the idea is to say we'll first assign the edge orders uh, so we'll take each edge on the mesh independently and we'll try to assign the edge order by solving a local representative 1d hp fem problem on, on for the operator of concert so essentially we take each edge and we uh, solve um uh, um uh, 1D Helmholtz problem or, you know, more complex operators uh, looking at um, the dispersion, the local dispersion relation and taking into account curvature um, as well. So you see here dispersion relation in the presence of flow, uh, which is more complex and uh, this is accounted for as well. Uh, it's, it's a very simple approach. Um, we, we just solve, you know, multiple 1D problems, which are basically inexpensive to solve. And this, we, we, we increase the order until we reach a, an error on this 1D problem that is lower than um, user-defined target accuracy. And then we propagate the orders uh, using element type dependent rules. Um, so we do that anisotropically. So we control the order in the different directions. Um, obviously, it's easier to do on the cube um, than on the pyramid or tetrahedron, but there is some level of anisotropy at play still uh, on the, um, uh, say, purely unstructured uh, non-tensor-based elements. And uh, we can get some reduction still, as I will show, uh, although marginal one, but, but still, on, on those uh, purely unstructured elements. And um, so these are basically rules to essentially if, if you know, E8, E5, E6 and E7 have a higher order, we will, we will increase uh, the polynomial order in that direction. Uh, that's, that's a toy problem just to show how things work in practice. Uh, it's a very unimpressive problem, but um, it allows to, to, to explain a bit the, um, the philosophy of, of the, the uh, adaptive, uh, a priori adaptive strategy that we've put in place. Um, so I'm solving just a um, guided wave problem from 200 to 2000 Hertz on this very coarse mesh. 
Um, you see here the orders. Um, I will play the movie afterwards, but let me just explain. Uh, this is the solution, numerical solution obtained. So this is the, the plane wave mode, that's the first mode. Uh, we're looking here at the cost, so that's the uh, factorization cost, and um, that's the error, and that's the error target. I'm going to play the movie now. So you see that the mesh is, is, is refined here. This is actually a one, a one PML layer, um, which with some an anisotropy in it. And you see that the orders propagate, the cost increases, obviously, and with this method, since we, we adjust the order with the frequency um, and the mesh is fixed, then uh, the cost increases with the frequency. And you see we are able to maintain the error uh, reasonably below uh, the, the target, apart from you know, this point where um, uh, the, the mode, uh, yeah, apart from this point. And um, that's, that's a bit in a nutshell how things work. Um, now, um, I, I'm, 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 there's, a, there's a, a funny feature in GMesh, uh, which um, uh, I wanted to use um, also to, to get some, uh, um, to have my son being interested in my work, I should confess. And um, so I, I took this Belgian hero uh, picture, and in GMesh you can, you can use a picture to prescribe uh, mesh density fields in a very natural way. And um, so I created this you know, highly non-uniform uh, mesh with um, strongly varying mesh densities. Um, I use my a priori or indicator that prescribes automatically the, the orders across the mesh. And you see that uh, that's, that's the technique introduced by Hergé, uh, which is called Linclair in French, is that um, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, plotting the drawing the contours and you see all the contours very well where we use order one uh, and order four here and five and six um, in the background. And um, this is the solution obtained on this mesh. And uh, the actual error, error the L2 error measured on, on the problem is, is close to the target error here. Uh, so here it's a Helmholtz number of 140. Then I had some fun with another model uh, with even uh, you know, more drastically uh, strong, stronger non-uniformities. And I, um, you see here the order ranges from 10 uh, to one in, in the shadow regions. And that's the solution propagated, propagated across the mesh. And L2R is again, fairly well controlled. So in spite of its simplicity, uh, these, this error indicator um, proves uh, quite robust in practice. Uh, what about poorly shaped elements? Um, well, for those of you who've, who've tried to do some, some meshing of, of complex parts, real life uh, engineering problems, mm, when, when you do the meshing, it's very often you, you, you get a warning from, from, the, from the tetrahedralizer, essentially saying you have poorly shaped elements. And you never know what is acceptable or not. Is, is an aspect ratio of 10, 20 still acceptable? It's, it's a very... Uh, Difficult question, and um, so we, we tried to, to to look at um, how we were coping with that with our indicator uh, by generating artificially some highly anisotropic meshes uh, on tries and, and quads, and um, this result here shows uh, for a, an increasing aspect ratio uh, and still the target accuracy of one percent. Uh, how do we control the error as you know the the, the element, basically the input mesh quality degrades. Uh, you see here the maximum order used, uh, typically in the X direction, and here the minimum order used, um, in, typically in the Y direction, and, and here for the quad. And um, so we're able to, to maintain a reasonable accuracy up to, to an aspect ratio of 20, uh, which I think is satisfactory. And um, we are also able to on these instruction meshes to remove some of the shape functions at no loss of accuracy, almost no loss of accuracy. That's what I call anisotropic. Um, I'm basically trying to keep um, a complete polynomial space in either directions um, while uh, removing some uh, terms. And uh, it allows to give a compression of 10% of the DOS at no loss of accuracy. So that, that's marginal, but it's still interesting. 
And obviously, it's a more efficient strategy to control directional orders on the quads. And uh, here we get up to 70% of uh, reduction of the DOFs, uh, where basically we have an order seven in the X direction and an order two in the Y direction. And I'm solving here, controlling here the L2, the max of the L2 error over 360 plane waves um, propagating through this mesh. And this, these were published also in the JCP uh, last year. Um, we also looked at, at curved elements. Um, I artificially bended the mesh, uh, curved it on, on this, this right part. Uh, obviously, the, the high order shape functions are constructed in the parametric space, in the UV space, right? So when they are mapped onto the physical space, there is a stretching happening. Um, and this stretching would degrade or maybe improve your resolution, but you have to take it into account. It's essentially, these are the edge orders. You see that um, although the mesh is initially symmetric, uh, we use higher order on the right because of the curving and we're able to maintain uh, constant uh, accuracy across the mesh. Now we looked also into convected acoustics. So there it's not the mesh that it is anisotropic, it's the physics because the wave um, the wave numbers are a direction dependent and we try to you know make a use of that to essentially decrease the order in the direction transverse to the flow and increase the order in the direction of the flow because to account for the presence of the upstream wave which is the, the most demanding uh, so we have no information on the direction uh, in the error indicator, we don't know anything about the loading or the boundary conditions. Um, it, it's a general um, excitation independent uh, approach. So we, we basically consider the upstream wave uh, in the direction of the flow and, um, and yeah, use the, the projection of the local dispersion uh, properties to account uh, to determine the order and control the accuracy. Uh, so that's the upstream direction uh, at 180 degrees. That's the downstream direction, which is obviously much more resolved. And um, let me then move on to, to a, a more complex application with flow. Um, so that was, um, I asked some questions to, to Brian Tester for this, actually. Um, we said uh, that, that it, was, it was interesting uh, to look at an air intake at cruise condition. Uh, not only at uh, what we do normally is to look at approach, uh, sideline, and um, cut back, but here uh, we look at really uh, the, the radiation um, for in cabin noise comfort uh, during cruise. And during cruise, the Mach number is very high, um, up to Mach 0.9, um, close to the nasal lips. Um, normally, the nasal is designed so as to avoid uh, supersonic bubbles. Uh, but it's very high Mach number, uh, so it's it's challenging from a numerical standpoint. And um, we, we use a hybrid mesh because it, we can control the order, as I said, in the direction of the flow, and we can reduce the number of DOFs. We're using here what we call the LPE, which is uh, essentially the scalar operator for propagation in potential flows. And uh, we solve at one BPF and two BPFs. And you see that it's a fairly challenging problem. The range of, wave, of wavelengths of lamp scales are very different, uh, you know, from, from the downstream to the upstream waves. And we, we controlled that the, the accuracy was, was, was a satisfactory with a reference solution. I'm showing here uh, that's without uh, anisotropy. You see here the orders uh, ranging from three to 14. And this is uh, using anisotropy. Uh, using different orders in each element in, in different directions. And um, this is, uh, you know, controlling the accuracy on a, uh, the, at, at far field. Uh, then that's, that's another application of our adaptive tool um, for a uh, car cavity. Uh, so that's, you know, typically the range of problems that we can solve. Um, I would say 30 times 30 times 30 uh, wavelengths on, on a big desktop with, with, with quite some RAM. Um, that's, you know, the, after that, you probably hit the, the you know, RAM memory uh, limit. And um, so here I'm doing a frequency sweep and I've created a series of meshes, a classical FEM mesh, and then some 
um, coarser meshes. So if you want to make use of the high order, uh, the power of high orders, obviously you need a coarser mesh, right? Because if you give to the error indicator a conventional fem overkilled, over refined uh, fem mesh, uh, of course the error indicator will tell you to to assign uh, linear order everywhere. So you, you it will be in the end a conventional fem calculation that you will run. So you need to coarsen. Uh, we, here we coarsen by keeping the same geometric accuracy, and uh, that's the speed up factor on the complete frequency sweep. So we we are two yeah twenty times faster on this coarse mesh, and these are the run times uh, over the frequency sweep uh, of the three different meshes. And you see that uh, at basically at low frequency, this is mostly using order one, so it's nearly constant, uh, but very fast. You know, one second solving. And then as soon as you ramp up in orders, of course, um, the cost increases and we have a cubic dependency um, here, which is what you would expect also from, from any HPFM calculation actually. So we, we, there's not much we can do about this. If you double the frequency, essentially you will have an order, you, you will multiply your, your cost by factor eight. And that's also observed on the memory requirements. So, so that's expected. But overall, between the FEM reference here, that's the cost in terms of gigabytes and, and solving time, uh, we are um, doing a much better work. That, that's another application, um, also with, with um, an interesting application, uh, a project with USB and Space Agency. So this is SimCenter 3D Acoustics, our, our platform. And you see here a satellite uh, in the middle of a, a, a stack of loudspeakers. This is to, to direct field acoustic testing to represent uh, the acoustic loadings at play during launch uh, in the fairing of a, of a rocket. Um, so that's for certification of satellites. And we have our test colleagues, actually, this is a digital twin of a real test setup, and we're doing cor correlation. And the, the mesh is, is, is non-uniform. You have um, to refine the mesh close to the loudspeaker membranes and too close to the uh, satellite itself. So it's it's very beneficial to have this high order uh, and adaptiveness because you don't have to care too much about your mesh. You, you just, you know, specify your frequency range and, and press solve. Again, that's for non-experts. Um, it, it allows to also test engineers uh, to, to launch uh, these solutions also because everything is scripted. So all the, even the cat generation here is scripted and the mesh generation, uh, the creation of the uh, non-reflecting boundary condition. Um, so you just have a, a test engineer, someone not expert in, in simulation and acoustic simulation can run this tool. And it's a vibroacoustic coupled, strongly coupled. So you see here uh, the response of the satellite. Um, so what, what I've showed so far focused on, on, on Helmholtz problems and, and scalar uh, convected problems, uh, operators. Um, we also looked into more complex operators like the linearized dollar equations, um, which supports entropy and hydrodynamic waves. And actually these waves have a, have a very different dispersion relation. Um, so it makes it very difficult to know um, at which, at, at which resolution should you solve. It, it's, a, it's, it's actually, a very difficult question. Um, and in the literature, we for time harmonic LEE, we generally people, you know, solve on, on two or three different matches and, and look at stagnation and and but that's that's fairly impractical. So we try to look at that uh, just from a, a pure understanding the different length scales, it's a multi-scale problem. So we, I try to show here for Mach number 0.5 the different admissible um, wave vectors. That's the upstream direction, the downstream direction in gray is the acoustics with the dispersion relation shown here. That's the range of admissible wave numbers, um, non-dimensional wave numbers, uh, non-dimensional, uh, not wave numbers, uh, lambda, sorry. And um, the that's the basically the upstream wave um, with uh, the downstream wave, so, sorry, with the larger wavelengths, and that's the upstream wave with the shorter wavelength that you see here. So this is all the range of admissible solutions. And I've, I've, I've plotted also in blue the range of admissible solution for the entropy and hydrodynamic waves, which you see here in, in, in blue, which are only 
convected with the mean flow, so they cannot propagate downstream. And you see that it's 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 um, it's an unbounded uh, range. So essentially, you you have to cope with infinitely short wavelengths. You cannot resolve everything. It's impossible. So the question is, where where do you cut? Where is the threshold? And it, I think this representation is useful because you see also that there is a decoupling at low Mach number. Um, you obviously don't expect the acoustic waves to interact too much with the hydro and entropy waves in, in this regime uh, because they are an order of magnitude different uh, in, in scales. And obviously, uh, you know, starting from Mach 0.5, um, they, they interact strongly. So uh, this, this was published in, in JSV uh, last year. And uh, we, we also proposed in that paper to couple uh, the LEE with a, a scalar operator, LPE, uh, in, in potential flows, um, just because LEE is very expensive. And um, we derived a way to couple them using characteristics um, in a robust fashion and uh, tested this on the moon problem. And um, we, we reached reasonable accuracy while drastically limiting um, you know, the computational cost, uh, it's very difficult to solve time harmonic LEEs in 3D at reasonable wave numbers. They're very, it's a very expensive operator. And you see here the, the, the vortex jetting, that's, that's a, a jet flow. And then we also computed, use our code for a um, um, Burnix case, which is also um, coming from, from uh, UK. Uh, this is courtesy of Brian Tester from ISVR. Um, uh, it was a European project where they had done some measurements and, and we obtained the flow from ISVR. Uh, at the time, it was only a systematic simulation done. Um, and yeah, 3D was sort of intractable. And we were able to solve uh, to reasonable, up to reasonable Helmholtz number in 3D. Uh, you see here some results for different modes. Um, and the results were matching with the, the result from the literature. And you see here the, the, the jet flow and uh, with uh, a hot jet uh, at the core uh, duct here and uh, the varying Mach number. And we use the LE uh, in that region, uh, as you can see here, and LPE uh, in, in the neighborhood. Um, we started recently to work also on thermoacoustics. Um, that's in the context of that Marie Curie project with Maria Hecker from, from Kiel University. And there we are trying to use, solve also linearized Navier-Stokes equation using I order adaptive FEM. Um, and um, this is for um, stability of uh, burners. It's an interesting application where there is a feedback loop, basically the, the flame in the burner, um, the heat release of the flame because becomes coupled with the uh, acoustics feedback. And if it's a constructive feedback, then you can basically destroy uh, your burner. And um, we use naive flame, flame modeling uh, using simple flame transfer functions, but that that's as is a first order. It gives already uh, the, the uh, a fair assessment on the different instability zones at which your burner could, could operate. Um, and this is a work done with uh, uh, Simone Otto and, um, and Alex Garcia, uh, our two uh, fellows in, in this project. Uh, we're also looking at, at um, bio um, poroelastics, um, which are notably very um, um, Inaccurate. I mean, it's difficult to obtain a good accuracy with conventional FEM for a number of reasons. Uh, it's a complex operator. You have a solid phase and a fluid phase with three different mutually coupled bio waves, a slow compressional, fast compressional, and shear wave. And uh, it's, it's difficult to know how to mesh, uh, what, what are meshing guidelines with conventional FEM. Um, also, the solid phase suffers from locking. It's, it's a difficult uh, problem uh, to address. And we're now looking at, uh, with Stein Jonker, uh, one of our postdocs, uh, at ways to, to yeah, introduce some of our, you know, adaptive PFM ideas in, in that context. And there we can control the, the, the phase, the solid and the fluid order um, in, in, independently, semi-independently. And uh, we are deriving an error indicator also for this case and testing many mesh topologies. And this is a metamaterial with um, actually an elastic inclusion that's a poor elastic foam. 
and we're retrieving results from the literature uh, with an automatic way of assigning the orders. Um, let me now briefly mention uh, our work on perfectly matched layers. Um, so I think PML are uh, now um, extensively used in acoustics uh, because they are very powerful, very accurate. Um, but I should say PML formulations are, are derived mostly for, for canonical shapes. You, you, you need a cuboid or a sphere or an elliptical shape or spe a specific coordinate uh, system. Um, and there are very few locally conformal PML concepts uh, for convex domains of, of general shape. And it's interesting to have a more geometrically flexible formulation because you can then surround your skater um, more efficiently, more closely, and, and reduce the um, amount of white space that you need around your skater, uh, thus reducing the computational cost. Um, this is a, um, actually a, um, 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 our um, tool in, in SimCenter 3D is called uh, AML, it stands for Automatically Matched Layer. It's an implementation of a locally conformal PML that I uh, introduced uh, already nearly 10 years ago. And I never had the chance to publish it because it's uh, because uh, publishing is not our primary objective. And uh, recently, I, 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 I did a collaboration with Axel Modav uh, from, from uh, the, the Poems Laboratory in France, and who was an expert in, in PMLs. And uh, he gave more of a mathematical perspective on, on my formulation. And uh, yeah, we did a joint paper, which is just being accepted in IGDME. And um, it's um, explaining the concept. So basically, we automatically extrude the mesh, which is not only beneficial from a user standpoint, because you don't have to mesh uh, the, the PML part. It's automatic in the solver. But also, it's useful for bookkeeping, uh, because uh, it's a simple idea. You can essentially use uh, the information during extrusion. You can keep track of the extrusion direction and the distance function very easily interpolate it and come out with your uh, complex Jacobian, uh, which is just written here. And the beauty of it is that you don't have to change your operator. So this would work um, equally well for uh, other operators. You just have to change J to make it J complex. And um, in, we, we, we show that it's equivalent for circular domain and elliptical domain. So this formulation is equivalent uh, on canonical shapes. Um, here for P equals one, two, and three. And this is increasing the number of PML layers. And that's the optimal L2 error in the physical domain um, that we, we, we measure. Um, and we also looked at performance on polygonal domains. What, what if you have sharp corners? And so these are the different domains we tried from three, four to five. And, and then uh, if you increase, of course, at some point you, 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 you get the circle, which is the optimal one. And uh, we automatically extrude the mesh. And this is the numerical solution we get for the, the usual uh, test case of, of plane wave uh, skatering on a cylinder. And this is the numerical error. So you see that the, the relative L2 error is, is, is not so good on the triangle um, due to the proximity of the circle and also to the presence of the sharp corners. As you see, the error uh, arises mostly in the corner, but also there uh, due to the presence of creeping waves. And um, But um, the, the other ones, like the, the, the square and the pentagon and so on, um, are reasonably accurate and reasonably accurate, including for only having one uh, PML layer. And that's, that's only with quadratic FEM. Um, and um, we did the same approach, uh, the same analysis in 3D uh, for, for varying, you know, the, the number of corners uh, up to the circle, and, and we got similar results. And this is comparing with an, another locally conformal uh, formulation from Osgun and Kuzuoglu, uh, which was published in JCP um, somewhere in 2008, I believe. And then as an applicative benchmark, uh, I used uh, one of my childhood uh, favorite objects, uh, the shark submarine of uh, Professor, uh, it's not Professor Sandflower. I, I think it's called Professor Calculus in, in English. Um, and um, 
so I, I, I got the CAD on the, on the GrabCAD um, and then I had to heal it to, to make it analysis suitable. But yeah, if, if one of you is interested, I can um, give you, uh, you know, a share, share the mesh with you. I think it's a nice model. And there's a, a very handy tool in, in SimCenter 3D in our um, product that you can just click on a button and you get the convex cell approximation. Uh, and so uh, you can get this mesh in two clicks and then you just uh, assign uh, an, an automatically matched layer, uh, our, our PML implementation on the surface, a bit like IFM uh, logic where you only have to define the surface. And it's automatically extruded in, in the solver. You don't even, the, the user doesn't even see it. And this is the, the scattering of a plane wave um, on, on the, on the subbrain shark or two different incidents. And that's the directivity. And we're already accurate with only just one layer. I mean, reasonably accurate. Um, and this is using a uh, quadratic film. In this paper, we didn't want to uh, mix uh, with a P film. Um, now, when you use PMLs and uh, for convected applications, you may run into trouble because PMLs act on the phase velocity and in the presence of flow, there is an inconsistency between phase. There, there can be there are regimes where phase and group velocity are inconsistent and the PML becomes unstable, as you can see here. That's just for a, a, a point in a, in a cross flow uh, point source. And um, there is an alternative model in the literature uh, proposed by, introduced by Bekash. Uh, but we found out that although at continuous level it's perfectly it's perfect uh, at the discrete level it's not optimal. So we we with uh, uh, Christophe Gezen and Xavier Antoine and our uh, PhD student Philippe Marchner did, did an amazing work. We essentially uh, reviewed um, all possible transformations and um, led to the conclusion that we one has to use the Lorentz transform in the PML. And this has just just been submitted. It's under review in the JCP. Um, so this is also for uh, convected acoustics, uh, for uh, guided uh, acoustics uh, in a duct. Uh, you see here the famous inverse of tree mode, which is very unstable. That's the alternative formulation, the Bekash formulation. And basically the Bekash formulation leads to a, a, a phase transformation in the PML, whereas the Lorentz um, maintains uh, the same uh, phase speed in the PML. A uh, quick word also on, on, on work we're doing on trying to parallelize this uh, higher adaptive code. Uh, you, we, we, you can rely on mumps. We, we've tried that. Um, you, but as soon as you hit, say, more than 10 or 20 uh, MPI processes, so you call Metis to do a, 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 a partitioning, and you try to do the, 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 the parallelism purely algebraically, you, you leave all the, all the the efforts on to the, the sparse solver, uh, you hit uh, um, um, the wall at some point, um, above say 10, 20 processes, the overheads become so high that you, you basically you, you fail to, to, to get a, a solution in a reasonable time. Uh, so we were looking into optimized Schwartz, uh, non-overlapping Schwartz domain decomposition methods with uh, Professor Gézé and Professor Antoine. And uh, we first thing we did is to extend uh, these methods to flow acoustics because the, the, to our knowledge, it had never been applied to flow acoustics. And um, we're also working on uh, non-reflecting, high order non-reflecting operators for, for these applications. Okay, so that leads me to, to the conclusion. Um, so we, our experience is that the use of PFM is highly beneficial for time harmonic acoustics. Uh, it allows to drastically reduce the computational cost. Um, you can limit pollution effect um, with the ad adaptivity because essentially your low orders, which are dispersive, will be only used in the lower part of the spectrum with a fixed mesh. Um, the efficiency does not drop out as, as you increase the order. Um, maybe by contrast to what is often said in the literature. Uh, the mass and stiffness matrix also can be um, assembled for the highest order because of the hierarchy. 
So that reduces also the assembly effort, which is done only once, only once for the frequency independent parts. Um, when you combine this with an a priori error indicator, you can use a single mesh to cover the complete range. Uh, it allows to make the solution almost mesh independent and right hand side independent. I, I, I'm not, I mean, the accuracy almost right hand side independent. Of course, um, you can always, uh, you know, find a, a typical source for which your, your indicator would fail. But for engineering purposes, it, it proved very, very useful. Uh, we're able to make an accuracy on highly non-homogeneous curved meshes. Um, the, the use of directional orders, it, it allows also to further reduce the cost when, when there is anisotropy in the mesh, high aspect ratio elements or in the physics convection. And so far we've applied the approach to Helmholtz, uh, linearized potential equations, LEs. Uh, we're currently investigating uh, bio and linearized anisotropes and also uh, I'm having some experiments with the acoustic perturbation equations, the APs. Um, we introduced an automatic perfectly matched layer for um, uh, tackling convex domains of general shape, uh, which is a fairly general formulation. I think it can be used also with other, um, other um, let's say, uh, discrete models. Uh, for flow applications, uh, Lorentz transformation may be applied inside BML to avoid instabilities, and we're looking into optimized Schwartz methods to limit the memory footprint of uh, the method. Yep. That would be it. Thank you for your attention. I'm open to questions. Fantastic. Well, uh, I don't know if you all want to mute your microphones and do a bit of a clap. Does that work on Zoom? I don't know. You can press the clap button. I'm going to clap anyway. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, that, that was fantastic. And, and Hadrian, uh, there's a few people apologised. They had to leave a few minutes early. I think a few people had meetings at two. So please do uh, have a look at the, the the nice comments that a few people have written there. Um, okay. Delighted to see the picture of the shark submarine. I was saying to Amelia on the <laughs> chat. That um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with the turnout today. But had we had that for marketing, I think we'd have had uh, maybe double the number. <laughs> uh, so, so that was that was fantastic. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, questions. I think the easiest way to run this is, is via the chat, uh, and then and then we'll try and um, if people are able to to speak and ask their question, we'll do that. Or if not, then myself or Amelia can read them out. Uh, I can see two here already. Um, so Simon Chandler Wild, who was unfortunately had to, to leave a few minutes ago, was asking about matrix solvers. Um, he asked, was it direct solvers? I think you mentioned mumps at a more recent slide. Yeah. Well, so should should I read through the, the questions? Uh, do, you, do you see the me highlighting the, the chat now? Uh, I don't see you highlighting it, no, I'm afraid. Ah, I see your so presentation, I, but... Uh, I will read then the, the questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so I didn't get what NNZ is and the different from NDOFs. Uh, so NNZ, sorry, that's a MATLAB. Uh, uh, it, it's a non-zero entries. So that's the number of terms in the matrix, in the sparse matrix. So Simon left, right? So yeah, I, Simon left. He asked, he asked about direct, about solvers. So using mumps most of the time. Yeah, right? yeah, we're, we're using mumps in parties. Okay, and then William Hardiman, are you still here? Uh, okay, I, you I see Valérie already answered. <laughs> Excellent, sorry. That's okay. Um, um, yeah. So I was wondering about uh, on the slide where you had the car and you had the computation time and the memory graphs for the frequency. Yep. Um, it looked like the computation time for your PFEM method yeah. Uh, we're going to exceed the computation time for the tra traditional FEM method and the same for the memory. Is this the case? Is there anything you can do about that? Um, you mean if, if I would continue the curve further? Yeah. Well, the thing is that this finite element mesh was, uh, so it's a quadratic finite element mesh, isoparametric FEM. And it was designed with eight points per wavelength uh, at the maximum frequency. So the thing is that 
if you would want to continue further, you would have also to refine your fem mesh. The fem mesh is supposedly valid only up to that point. And oh, actually, okay, yep. if you read the paper, we also show comparisons where we have this typical behavior of, um, you see the peaks slightly um, uh, deviate. Um, I don't know if you've had the occasions to, to you know, launch uh, a simulation, plot the FRF, launch a refined for, uh, solution after that, and plot the FRF again. And you see that the peaks match at lower frequency, but at higher frequency, you typically see the, the peaks uh, deviate a bit. That's typical of dispersion of the pollution effect. And we're already seeing this. So essentially, this is already, um, the FEM is already proving not so accurate uh, in the range of frequencies considered here. I don't know if that Thank you. question. There's not much else in the chat. I can see a couple of people have unmuted themselves. So that, are you that to ask questions? Perhaps not. Um, I, I'll ask a question that's selfishly for my own interest then, which is um, you've, you've obviously shown, uh, well, first of all, uh, it's great to see how an established methods such as FEM can be further enhanced by methods from, from academia. So obviously, as you say, you kind of work with people from academia and it's great to see how work from your own PhD came in and has been quite transformative here. And then uh, it's also interesting how it's been proven for straightforward linear acoustics and then extended to more complicated physics. That's, that's really impressive to see that done and, and how well it's worked. Uh, my question was just a selfish one about, um, high-order high polynomial versus Treft's methods. Uh, yeah. Your comments were for volumetric methods such as FEM and discontinuous Galerkin. Um, of course, you worked a bit in boundary integral methods based on um, sort of Treft's type plane wave approaches. Have, have you made that comparison versus polynomial for boundary elements? Um, so I, I only did the limited, uh, I mean, I, work, I did this work in PhD and um, since then I haven't looked um, into uh, TREFS based FEM, but um, with my colleague Honor Attack, we're now looking at um, higher polynomials uh, for BEM. And <laughs> actually, my um, concern at the time when I was doing TREFS based BEM was that the assembly cost was, was uh, becoming intractable, uh, that we was overly dominating and um, yeah, the, um, I think the, the, the key there is that you have somehow to work on the assembly cost. And uh, that's uh, what my, my colleague Ono and now is, 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 has been um, looking at how to basically look in, yeah, to, to um, uh, you know, introduce fast multiple acceleration in, into these methods. And, uh, but I wouldn't be able to comment on uh, you know, the respective merits of TREFS based BEM against higher order polynomial BEM. I think they could be comparable, um, but but that's just an intuition. Okay, uh, that's very interesting to hear that the boundary element codes sort of you're moving the innovation from the FEM over to the boundary element as well. Uh, that's really interesting to hear. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Well, I'll also comment that it was very, very interesting to see the uh, the DFAN simulation um, mentioned. That's something that's happening at the um, the new satellite test testing facility that's being built down in Oxfordshire at the minute. So uh, uh, that's something that's that's happening in the UK as well, which is also really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. So the the, the space centre of is that Leicester or am I no? Um, no. So they're building no. a new. That wasn't the one I was referring to. Um, okay. I, I could I can talk to you separately about this if, if you're interested. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. So so they're looking at defan testing uh, at the moment and simulation there. I, th I think they're already talking to Siemens, so it's it's not a. Uh, I think so. Um, but yeah, interesting to see see that mentioned as well. So. Yeah, and that's that's um, you know there's a, a whole fuss about digital twins, currently, and um, how can you use simulation. Um, you know, to, to, to really support uh, the design of, of, of products or all along their life cycle. And, and that's, that's an example where we really have um, a, a digital replicate of an actual test. So what we're doing now is 
is comparing one to one uh, the test results where we use control to ensure um, uh, a rare burn field around the satellite and the simulation. And we were um, amazed to see that we, we, we got a reasonable, uh, without model updating, you know, without you know, turning the knobs, we already get uh, to plus two plus minus dB, uh, plus two minus two dB over a, a decent frequency range. Um, uh, you know, just from a, from a blind uh, correlation uh, using using these tools. So, you know, simulation can be fairly accurate in spite of all the indeterminacies of possible nonlinearities of, of, you know, things you don't know. Um, on, on such a complicated application, we were uh, thrilled to see that we were already reasonably accurate. That's good. That's really exciting. And, and, and also there, I mean, that's another... For anyone writing funding bids and things, that's another interesting thought, which is that you're not only trying to simulate products in 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 computer simulation systems using computational acoustics, but you might be trying to simulate real physical tests before you actually undertake them. Uh, so that's another use that people might not be doing. So unless there's any other questions, I think we'll just thank our speaker one more time. So thank you very much, Hadrian. Um, and uh, we have another of these, Amelia, in two weeks. That's correct. We have um, webinars every two weeks now until the end of November. And you can find out more on the UCAN events pages and sign up there for all of the ones up until the end of November now. Lovely. And this recording is going to be made available somewhere or other. Uh, that'll be on the mailing list. Lovely. So thank you all very much for joining. Uh, and that's been, uh, yeah, it's been, been a delight. So thank you very much.